what's going on. So I have about an hour and then I have to go pick up my kids at school. But the baby is down and I just had a nap and he was like laying on top of me. And it's not like a deep sleep because you know, you're like, you don't want to roll over on top of him and stuff, but it's like the best, the best sleep. And even my four year old now, I'm like, hey buddy, you wanna, wanna cuddle and have a nap? And he's like, nah. <laughs> it's like a single tear rolls down my cheek like like a Denzel in glory but uh but uh it's 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 wonderful um so I'm here to do uh what's up Amir I'm here to do um uh, a QA and a because I really love answering questions and it's not because I have the answers it's not it's because I like thinking about what the answers could be and then I put it out there so you guys can be like whoa you were way off or that's a good idea I mean it's just it's like the competition of ideas and I just I'm just such a proponent of that and my ego really isn't aligned with um, being right it's really not I really am just my ego is aligned with trying to find the right answer so um, yeah oh yeah Gloria's great movie though so here I got a bunch of questions I'm just gonna go through them I don't know what they say I haven't looked at them yet how are LA teachers feeling about mandated vaccines as a whole? Um, I think for the most part, I'm not in LAUSD, uh, uh, not anymore. And so I think for the most part, teachers are on board with the vaccines being a good idea. I think there are probably some that uh, are hesitant for, for a couple of reasons, but I haven't heard too much big pushback uh, about it from my friends in LAUSD. But, um, this is fairly new, so I am gonna reach out to them and, and ask them. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the, in the comments too. I just, I love all these questions, it's interesting. Uh, this is one. Oh, I'm admired. Oh. How do you feel about the evolving research of efficacy lowering? Um, very nice to say that um, I'm admired. Hopefully it's more for like my mindset, my approach, because um, I don't know what I'm doing. But. Um, Evolving research of efficacy lowering. Um, I guess that would be about the vaccine. I'm assuming uh, lowering how effective it is and things like that. Uh, that's a tricky one. I just heard um, Sagar and Jetty from from um, Breaking Points talk about how he got COVID and he was vaccinated and it was still pretty bad and stuff like that. I don't know. You know, I think that there's there's a real balance here that we we you know our community has to um, figure out which is how much of this is evolving science thing. We don't know. So we're, here's the vaccine and it seems to help. It doesn't help in these ways. So we're gonna keep changing, kind of moving the goalposts to be more accurate. You know, you gotta change the games of basketball. So when James, uh, what's his name? Nate, uh, James Naismith invented basketball. You know, there was no like um, goaltending rule. Okay, and then Will Chamberlain comes along to start swatting away balls and they go, all right, let's change the rules. So you have to kind of update. How much of it is that? Some. How much of the change of the goalposts is, you know, uh, market incentives and things like that corrupting information? Um, some, I think it's some. You know the uh, sorry, some on the tooth. Um, look, we can't we can't say can't recognize that big pharma is the most entrenched billion dollar industry in the world it's the most entrenched and what i mean by entrenched is they give the most money to lobby the government by far it's twice as much as the second one which is insurance companies they give 4.4 billion dollars they have 1600 1600 lobbyists for the 535 members of congress um, in the house and the senate to say that they don't have some sort of influence over this stuff is wildly ignorant now how much I don't know, but some, so let's not discount that there's some <clears throat> level of shenanigans because especially people on the left, you know that big corporations are gross. You should. I mean, that was a big thing of the left, you know, big pharma, big corporations, all this money going into politics and stuff like that. So that's there and science is always evolving. So that's true too. So we can, I, I, I think I don't know, I don't have a whole lot of conflict here. Where my conflict is, is like, well, how much is this and how much is that? And I think that's where the conversation needs to be, like a, like a cylinder almost. That's where the conversation needs to be, is more about how much of this is uh, corruption and how much of this is changing science and new information. 
I don't know, but that's a, I think that's a very valid conversation to have. Uh, would I get a 13 year old kid vaccinated? <clears throat> I don't know. That's a tough one. Cause as I said, I'm vaccinated and I just coughed and, <laughs> um, I have a four and a six year old. They might push for them to get vaccinated. I, I am way more hesitant for them than I am for me personally. What's the difference? Well, the difference would be, I don't have my graphs, but like when you look at who is the most affected by COVID, the younger you get, the least affected you are. Um, their bodies just aren't as resilient. You know, like I've had some crazy medical stuff. I've spent a lot of time in the hospital. Um, and even I had a hemorrhagic stroke and I had a midline for you medical people, you know, I had, a, I had a midline shift of, I forget exactly what it was now. It was like nine millimeters or something like that. It was, I was and I, like 12 or 13, you're brain dead, you're dead. So like it was bad and I bounced back pretty quick. So I think that putting that into smaller fragile bodies when it is more unknown and still testing, like I'm more okay being a guinea pig to level that, you know, we vaccinate people like guinea pigs more so than my kids. I'll put myself in more um, potential harm than I would my kids. 13, it's borderline. I'm not giving advice about vaccines to get them, which a lot of people are just like, get it, get it, get it. I'm not saying that. Get them or not get them, I don't know. Um, I think you gotta talk to your pediatrician and I think you gotta talk to a lot of, um, I guess it's something that I, that I just kind of uh, thought about. I think medical professionals that are your friends with. So if you're friends with a pediatrician, that's a good one. If you're friends with a lot of nurses and medical experts and doctors and stuff like that, because I think that there is a tendency if you're a doctor to lean on the side of being extra cautious to avoid lawsuits. I think that, and I, again, with my experiences, and I've had a lot of medical experiences, uh, negative ones, um, a lot of doctors were scared to get sued. So that, that, that kind of handcuffs them about um, uh, what they can say and taking chances and all that kind of stuff. So I think forming friendships, I think, with people and asking them um, would, be, would be really beneficial. I don't know. That, that's a really tough one, though. Uh, masking toddlers and children. <clears throat> this is one that I thought was bad. Uh, I picked up my kid from school one day and he's like, yeah, I had trouble breathing. And I was like, oh, that's bad. But then my, um, my four-year-old was in preschool and he doesn't even notice it. Um, I think talk to your kid, ask him and don't try and put like, um, look, take my advice for whatever it is. <laughs> so, uh, but I think talking to your kids, asking, not putting ideas in your head, like it was hard to breathe, right, buddy? Like, no, not that, but just like, what are your thoughts on the mask? See what they say. If they say it's really hard to breathe, it's really uncomfortable. Um, also, sometimes toddlers, children, like they sneeze in there, it gets wet. And then having like a wet rag over your, your face is, I mean, that's waterborne. That's bad. So I think having change of masks and stuff like that, if you have to. But I, I would, what I do, again, for what it's worth, I don't know. Um, is talk to my kids a lot about what they're comfortable with and what they're not. And if my kid says he's really, so what happened was my older kid said he would, had trouble breathing. So we got him one of those, I don't think it's here, but one of those like kind of BS masks and it's pretty porous, let's say. Um, just cause he said he had trouble breathing. Then my little one, um, we get to, he said, yeah, you can pick, do you want the mask that you can breathe better out of or the mask that you can't? And he chose the one that had like polka dots on it that you can't breathe out of. So, um, I think, as much as four-year-olds are idiots, uh, I think they know what is like comfortable because they're they're kind of like um, the kind of wimps when it comes to being uncomfortable in a lot of ways. Uh, what's this? My takes on abortion and non-binary plus identities. Whoa, that is a question. Um, I did a video maybe like two years ago now or a year and a half ago on abortion. And I compare it to uh, the arguments for the Civil War. Here's, here's why I think I figured out, I think I figured out the abortion issue. <laughs> Not which side, but I think I figured out really why um, it's so contentious is you pin, I've said this before, but it pins um, life against freedom. 
And there's no clear cut which one's more important, life or freedom. They're very, they're very much. Um, people give up their freedom all the time to save their life. And people give up their lives all the time for freedom. Do you ever see Braveheart? So what happened in the Civil War was people were saying like, um, you know, what about the slaves? What about the, the enslaved people? What about the enslaved people? And then the people who were pro-slavery or against abolition were like, what about, the, you know, make, getting food for my family and, you know, getting food on the table and um, keeping an economic system that's, that's able to sustain? It's like, we're not talking about economics. We're talking about people. And the other people are like, we're not talking about people. We're talking about economics. Well, that's what's happening in abortion is the pro-choice, you know, you know pro-choice people, they're saying, don't tell a woman what to do with her body. Talk to a pro-life person. Pro-life people are saying, don't, uh, don't kill a baby. And the pro-choice is like, we're not talking about a baby. We're talking about the woman. And then the pro-life people are like, we're not talking about the woman, we're talking about the baby. So what's happening is we're, we're missing each other. It's a circle in the, the square, or a rectangle. So the abortion issue, I don't know where I stand on that one. I think I would lean more towards um, pro-choice as far as policy goes. And the reason I would be, I, I am uh, more pro-choice is not because I'm like a fan of abortion, but the reason I personally, I'll just an open book, am pro-choice is I believe that abortions will happen regardless. I'm not a fan of prohibition. I'm a big you know, ad, vocal advocate against the war on drugs. Um, I think when you ban things that people want to do or ban things that people um, are, uh, feel like people are people view as important to them, they're going to do it anyway. And I would rather have abortions be as Hillary Clinton, my <laughs> huge fan of Hillary Clinton. Uh, um, but what she said was a while ago was something like abortion should be, what was it? It was like, it was like safe and rare or something like that. And I think that's probably the ideal when it comes to abortion is if you're going to get one, which people are going to get them anyway, let's not have them be, you know, whatever, what they call like back alley abortions. Um, Non-binary plus identities, very tricky. I think a lot of this is aligned with um, individuals. I think we have to do more um, psychological evaluations on people who have um, different identities and things like that. Look, this is not safe, legal, and rare. Yeah, thank you. That's exactly what it is. Um, but this is not saying like, oh, well, that means if you're, you know, a non-binary person and you have like psychological issues. Look, I got psychological issues. Okay, we all have psychological issues, so don't get too sensitive about that. But yeah, you have psychological issues. Okay, there's conflict. I had a, my my most recent podcast was with Mac Beggs, and I talked to him about that. Like, is there a, like like there's a conflict in you, right? And he made that there's a conflict between what your body and hormones are doing and what your mind is doing because he's trans. And you know, there is like that conflict in your mind and we all have conflicts. You know, this is like a Carl Jun thing, which was my last post, I think. Carl Jun talking about your shadow self. So there is this conflict all the time. There's gonna be a lot of conflict in people that are non-binary. And that conflict within all of us is something you gotta sort out. Because just, if you just say you're non-binary, that's not gonna fix that conflict. Even if society says you're wonderful, you're great, you're a hero, you're so brave, that's not going to fix that conflict. And again, we all have that conflict. So that's, that's a tricky issue. Uh, a more Tulsi Gabbard-like position where abortion is banned after three months. Okay, so the idea of banning abortion after the first um, trimester, yeah, except for doctors who, um, who you know, say that it's like for health reasons and stuff like that, right? I mean, there's that issue too. And what happens if in the second trimester you find out the baby is severely um, disabled. That actually happened to a friend of ours. It's such a sad story. Um, they decided to abort and um, so sad. And um, because the baby was going to have like no arms or legs and um, like some organs on the outside of their body and stuff like that. So they decided to abort it. And that's, it's, it's horrible. It's heartbreaking. I, one of my early podcasts was with an, um, a woman who was in residency to become an abortion doctor. She wanted to become a doctor to give uh, safe abortions. And, um, and I did get her to admit, though, that abortions are unfortunate. They're not ideal. And she said she hadn't even thought about that, which, is, which was actually startling to me. But um, they're not ideal. Anytime an abortion happens, it's not ideal. 
And I think that's that's something that we can we can put out there and we can find common ground on. Um, why is the COVID vaccine more controversial than say the flu vaccine? Uh, it's well, it's more controversial for a couple of reasons. One is it's new, so new things are going to be controversial. That's why progressive ideas are controversial because it's like, well, we haven't seen this before. Um, uh, so I think that's a big one. Also, uh, I think that the, the way that the COVID vaccine is being pushed is what's so controversial. When the, if the flu vaccine, and it has it's in certain areas saying like, hey, you have to mandate flu vaccine for schools and stuff. There actually was big pushback for that. It's the way it's being pushed and bullied. Um, people are being bullied in one way or, or the other about the vaccine. I think that's a real problem. Um, what is this one? What, oh, vaccine did I get? And what was my experience? So... I got the um, Pfizer vaccine. Uh, first one, I didn't feel anything, little soreness in my arm. Uh, second one, I got, I had like night sweats. Like I sweated a lot at night. Like a lot, like it was, cr it was crazy actually. Like the sheet, we were in our, our RV and um, I took off the sheet and it was like, it was like, a, it was almost like it was made out of like, like, a, like plastic or something. It was so soaked. You could just wring it out. Um, but no fever or anything, but a bunch of people in my family and stuff had fevers and things like that. Uh, yeah, so, but it was, it was okay. It was okay, but I got Pfizer. Um, oh, I do wanna go live with people, but just right now I'm trying to go through this and I have to pick up my kid at uh, 1.30 our time, so I just, but I'll, I'll try and go live more because I do, I do love going live and talking to you guys. So I, I promise I will do this more, maybe between classes and stuff like that. I, I'm gonna try and get in the office so I can jump on here sometimes. Um, thoughts on pronoun debate. Um, okay, pronoun debate. Well, one of my like educational mentors is Jordan Peterson. So there's probably no surprise here, but uh, I am against compelled speech. Okay, compelled speech I think is bad. So if you wanna do, a, um, if someone asks, and I've had you know several trans students and friends, and I've done six podcasts now with trans individuals. I'm gonna release one today or tomorrow with another um, trans, uh, Xander Keg, who's awesome. Um, but uh, when they say these are my pronouns, can you honor them? Like, yeah, yeah. But mandating it, that's the problem. I'm a freedom dude, yay, 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 yay. Like, that's, that's, Good things come from that because they come from battle of ideas. Um, you know, like honor people's um, wishes, but if you don't want to, you don't have to. Like it's you're perfectly free to be a wonderful person or free to be an asshole. Thoughts on Thomas Sowell? Um, oh, I think Thomas Sowell is brilliant. I don't like how involved in politics he's become. I think it actually takes away from his ideas. I wish he would stay out of the political realm a little bit more because I think he'd be taken more seriously. But I think Thomas Sowell, um, I have several of his books. I have one of his books right there. Yeah. Actually, I haven't read yet, but um, Thomas Sowell, um, White Liberals, Black Rednecks, stuff like that. I mean, it's, he's, he's brilliant. He's great. He's great. Um, I just don't like his political, like the way he gets involved in politics personally. But no, I think Thomas Sowell is a really important author that we should be teaching in schools. Uh, ever planning on traveling to do talks or seminars? Oh, you come see me in New York City? That would be incredible. Um, yeah, I get, you know, this is, this is, this whole thing is amazing. Um, like the community uh, of people that I have here and stuff like that. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm a freedom gal. Um, it, it's like, it's like if the demand is there, I'm trying to like serve, you know, I, that's in, whether it's students or crew here or whatever, I would love to maybe not like do anything formal, but, um, you know, some sort of like meetup or something like that. Yeah. I think I'm a, I'm going to plan on traveling. Once this little peanut that I got gets a little older, my wife, my wife is awesome. Um, if you know who she is, but she's in like the, um, beauty industry and stuff like that. And she actually does to get paid to do like speeches and stuff. So I just, I'm like, I'm like a tag along, but there might be a way that um, as she goes to these different places, I can hold something and just like meet up with people. I would love that. I would love that. Um, book recommendations. Yona Feld, what's going on? Um, book recommendations. Well, okay. Well, I have, if you want like short books, I got them right here, but um, so, well, Man's Search for Meaning, 
If you haven't read Man's Search for Meaning, you don't feel you probably have. If you haven't read Man's Search for Meaning, life-changing book. Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt, life-changing book. Um, this, this is um, David Foster Wallace. Now this was actually a commencement speech. It's short, it's really short. Commencement speech um, that he gave, and it's called This Is Water, and it's just a great metaphor for life. And it's short, it's a cool little book um, that I, I couldn't recommend more. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing. Read Man's Search for Meaning. <laughs> uh, I think the way you think and reason is awesome. More people need to follow you and take example. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I do want more of a following. And part of that is to get um, better challenges. A lot of the people that challenge my ideas, that say like, you're terrible, and I get my fair share, they don't want to talk to me in any kind of um, like real like way. And their ideas are, are, aren't very good. Like I, I want steel sharp and steel. I want my ideas to get kind of criticized. And some of you are really excellent at this. And I appreciate you and it's so, um, it's so beneficial for me. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I do want a bigger following to some degree. I just, I get weird about promoting it. Am I familiar with Naval Ravikant? Yes, go through my feed. I got stuff from like the past three years. I've talked about Naval quite a bit. Naval Ravikant is amazing super brilliant and what he does is a very similar thing that uh, Salome Sibonet, uh, who I had on my podcast before, the, the writer, what she does. She writes something that's like maybe two or three lines and it's true on the surface, then you dig deep and it's still really true the deeper you dig. I love that stuff. And Naval Ravikant has it. He gives like one, one like sentence thing and it's deep, layers deep. I'm gonna make a video on that actually about, about seeking like unpeeling the onion and it just gets more and more true. I love that stuff. I love that. It's real. It's like, it's like my favorite. So yeah, I know I'm aware of Nepal. Um, this one, this is so fun by the way. Thank you guys. Um, private business mandating vaccine for employees and our customers. It's tricky. I was talking to someone they were like, um, you know, this company is mandating vaccines and they said, you know, why are you forcing me to get the vaccine? They say, I'm not forcing you. It's a decision, but if you don't get it, then you don't get your job. It's like, like tell that to a single mom of three, you know, like what, what are we doing? What are we doing guys? This is, you can't just play around with people's jobs. Take it from someone who's been, <laughs> had like cancel moms come after him. Luckily, the school that I work for is like a, it's like a unicorn. Um, and again, my wife is just a badass and, and you know, has our back financially because that's a scary thing. Threatening people to lose their jobs is no small thing. And we're in a place in society right now. I mean, do you, you see this too, right? Like people like how like Burger King can't keep staff and they're, they're one of our favorite breakfast spots, they had to close down because staff won't come in like this. This idea. So here's here's an example because I'm white, <laughs> like I'm like a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant from the Northeast. Everyone in my family is white. The whole family tree is just white. It's like a birch tree, <laughs> and uh, and real college educated and stuff like that. And I got my first paycheck, and there was something in Pennsylvania that said uh, occupational privilege tax. And I remember my parents being like, "Can you believe that? Ugh, they're making it seem like it's a privilege to work." And when I shared that with my wife, who's from the Philippines and came to this country, you know, 10 of them in a one bedroom apartment and stuff like that. Like they were poor. They're like, it is a huge privilege to work. I think we've lost that in America. I think we don't feel like it's a, it's a privilege to work. Um, so I think that there's, we have to remember that, that, um, that it's a, it's a, it's a huge privilege to be able to, to work and provide for yourself and your loved ones. You know, um, there's a, I, I subscribe, and I know some people, a lot of people don't, but I subscribe to the idea that the greatest form of charity is, is an opportunity to, to work and earn your own money. I think that that's, you know, teach a man to fish type of thing. Um, so uh, this, is, this is a tricky one. This is a tricky one. Um, which group gaslights more, pro-vaxxers or anti-hesitant? Pro-vaxxers, anti um, So gaslighting is one of those things I think I talked about on my stories. Um, it's like trying to get you to question your reality. Man, I don't know. They're both pretty bad. Some of y'all are pretty bad. <laughs> like, 
because you're making it seem like it's more dangerous or more safe than it is. And even when I had April on my Instagram live, who went through like hell, I mean, what she went through, it's a, it's a, it was a fascinating conversation. You should check it out. Um, she still said it's probably good that people should get it. So I don't know. I think we, I think we're, I think both sides are guilty. I wouldn't say that one it, that I've seen uh, that I've seen is, is worse than the other. I haven't seen that. Um, what do I think of Crystal and Sagar's take on Afghanistan? So they are very much in the camp of we should get out, no foreign wars. You know, I love Tulsi Gabbard. It's like the only politician I really like. Um, and she, you know, I think would, would be for that. I think she'd probably do it better because she's, if you don't know who Tulsi is, she's amazing. Um, I'm a gaslighting Jedi, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy. Um, but uh, but um, one of the things, Tol Tulsi is really close with Jocko Willink. And I think that if you saw Jocko, I posted my story, but Jocko said like, here's the way I would handle if I was president. I think if we ever are able to have a, a Tulsi Gabbard president, I think she would bring people like Jocko in as like a, as like a, a, a you know, whatever, an aide or something like that. And I, so I think she would want to get out, but I think she would probably do it in a, in a better way. And I think that seems like the ideal because I do not like these endless wars, especially like, here's another example is I had, I taught in like bad, like the worst areas of LA. And I had a lot of students who got into college and they couldn't afford it. So they went in, joined the Marines, joined the army. They're kicking in doors in Fallujah and Ramadi and they're going th into Afghanistan so that they can pay for college. And then when you teach wealthy kids, they don't do that. Like that's, that sucks. Like who's fighting these wars or like, like my former high school students, you know, like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's an interesting thing. So, you know, there's a lot of people who are, you know, like Bernie Sanders and Tulsi were close because Tulsi supported Bernie Sanders over Hillary and Tucker Carlson loves Tulsi. So if you can find those overlaps, you know, that's something that's, that's, I think really incredible, you know, and the way she comes across things with like, you know, like with so much heart, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't like these regime change wars. I think we have a military for a reason. And if we are in danger, then we go and we, you know, it's kind of like, you know, have that sword, keep it sheathed or that meme you might've seen where it's like, just because I'm peaceful doesn't mean that, you know, I've forgotten how to be violent type of thing, you know, as I'm a martial artist. <laughs> um, you know, I think that that's a really important thing is like, you know, you, you, you keep it sheathed as long as you can. But if you want to, you want to go, let's go. And America will always be, you know, the most dominant military force, but we don't need to flex on everybody. You know, like Teddy Roosevelt and the, uh, what is it? The great white fleet. Um, so I, again, I, I would say that, um, Crystal and Sager, they're a little bit more extreme. They're a little bit more, um, in favor of the way it went down, I think than I am. But overall, I, I tend to agree that I don't like these, 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 um, regime change wars and having a presence to just watch over potential terrorist uprisings. I think, I think is cool. Um, what is this one? If CRT hates the racist system, why give more power to the government systems? Um, yeah, well, the, if you're trying to get me to, to, if this is a sincere question, I can steal man why people who are in support of ideas like critical race theory would say, um, to give more power to the government systems is because you have to fix this on a systemic level and systems are at least at the very least heavily influenced, let's say by government action. So the only way to really fix it is from within. So if there's a problem with the education system, then you need teachers and administrators and stuff like that to fix it. So I think that that would be probably the, the best argument for it. But yeah, I mean, this is something that comes up a lot where people are like, you know, only the government should have the guns and you're like, and then when like Trump was in office, like, so you just want to give Trump and his people, like all the guns, like, well, no, it's like, well, the government's made up of people guys. And we're all fallible. And you know, people are, we're, we're all messed up. We all got our own biases. Uh, peer review is made up of people, you know? So, you know, like these systems are not perfect. They're, they're deeply flawed, but we have to trust them to some degree. And again, like I said in my stories earlier, like what, where the line is, is where you and I will differ. Is you think that this, the systems, academia, media, whatever, politics should be trusted this here. And I might think here. And then you might think there. And like that's, and that's where we can have the conversation. 
uh, what is this? Oh, response couldn't be shared. What more important? What what more important? Freedom of choice or maximizing the health of in American individuals? Look, you're not maximizing the health of American individuals if you're not addressing the crisis of obesity in America. I'm sorry. That is how you maximize the health of American individuals. If we're not talking about that, then you're not being genuine in this concern, okay? So if this is about the vaccine, then that's a different thing. But that's not maximizing the health of American individuals. It's not. So if we're saying like, you know, some sort of incentives um, for like buying cheaper food or putting limits on on thing on like fast food the way that they did on cigarettes or something like that, I'm I'm more okay with that. Um, but freedom of choice is I mean. Look, that's America. America is the place where it's these, this, it's the wild west. It's crazy. It's, we're, we're wild people. And hopefully we can, we can use that, that freedom to take bad ideas and good ideas and mix them together and see what comes out on top. And that's why we need the press to do their job and all that kind of stuff and keep the, whoever's at the top of these hierarchies, which are the super duper elite, um, from limiting that freedom. Because as we've seen in California, um, we don't have that, uh, it, you know, we, the, the, the elites don't follow their own rules, essentially. Obesity isn't contagious though. Um, uh, well, obesity, well, to say it's not contagious, I guess it depends on what you mean by that. Cause you know, if you hang out in a house where everyone eats terribly, then it's very difficult to, to not do that. Um, but look, the, if you, we need to address the obesity issue. If you're trying to stop COVID, address the obesity issue. If you're trying to stop the number one, number two killers in the country, heart disease and cancer, you gotta address obesity. But it's a sensitive issue. And addressing it is not bullying. You don't bully people who are overweight. You know, you see, you go to the gym, there's someone who's like obese and they're on a, an elliptical laughing at them. It's like, nah, man, that girl, that guy's doing, doing the hard thing. It sucks going to a gym. When you're when you got twig arms or when you're you know overweight, that's bold. So you know encourage one another. But then at the end of the day, you got your freedom of choice to do whatever you want. Um, what would I tell a 25 year old? Oh, I got their whole life ahead of you. Um, you can act selfishly if you don't have a spouse or a kids yet, and. Um, I would say to a 25 year old, find the thing you love working hard at. Find the thing you love busting your butt at. Because if you can find the thing that you just love grinding, you put on another cup, pot of coffee, you're like it's three in the morning, but I just want to keep working, whatever it is, that's gold and you will be tremendously successful. Find the thing that you love working hard at. That's what I'd say. So search, try, try things, start doing grind. If you're like, oh, I hate this grind find something else. You'll find it. I love this stuff. Uh, what's the major cause for political division? The major cause is um, our different moral foundations. So read The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. He broke down morality. Across, and the, the subtitle is Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. Okay. That's the major cause for political division is we, we view morality differently, okay? So there's like moral taste buds and um, cilantro doesn't taste objectively bad, but to something like 15% of the population it tastes like soap. You ask your waiter, what's the tastiest thing on the menu? And they say the salmon and then you're like, oh, I hate salmon. Like it's not objective. Morality isn't either. It's, it's, it's a fascinating book. There's a TED talk too. It's 18 minutes long. Highly recommend it. Uh, but that is the major cause of our political divisions is we see the other side as immoral. And they're not. These individuals could be immoral, but they break those foundations. So, you know, there are, there are a lot of ways that you can be immoral. I'm not saying, that, I'm not a moral relativist by any stretch. But 
but there's a there there's a difference in the way we view morality. Uh, the book was called The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. And if you go on my, like, um, on my, whatever it is, Instagram, and you, like, go through, like, the top, like, the stories, there's one that says books. It's on there for sure. It's on my website, too. Book Game Changer. Uh, I have, like, 15 minutes. Um, work, oh, thoughts on segregation discrimination happening for the unvaxxed. So this is an interesting one because um, Ibram X. Kendi's definition of racism is when there are um, disparate out, um, outcomes. So if there's an outcome that disproportionately negatively affects uh, a certain group, like let's say like a group of people of color, then that is a racist policy. So according to Ibram X. Kendi's definition, which is you know pretty widely accepted within a lot of like the anti-racist community because he wrote the, the manual, right? How to be an anti-racist. Then the vaccination... Uh, the vaccine passports are systemically racist. Now, do I agree with that? No, but only because I disagree with Hiram X. Kendi. But if you want to believe by Hiram X. Kendi's definition, then yes, yes, that's that's racial discrimination. So um, it all depends on definition. This is why common language is so important. We need to have common language. And I think that if we clear up our language and we're using the same definitions of these like controversial terms, like, um, like racism, um, controversial terms, like discrimination stuff, we just align like, is this what you mean? Yes. That's what I mean. Is that what you mean? Yes. That's what I mean. Okay, cool. Then we can get somewhere. But when you're, when you're using different definitions, we're going to miss each other all day long, all day. Um, what is the most hurtful thing a family member has said to you about your political opinions? Um, not to me, but to my wife. So as I said, I'm from this super lily white family. Uh, everyone in my family is white. My wife is the first non-white person in the history of my family, the whole family tree, going back to like the 1700s or something like that. And they have been really harsh with her because she's conservative, came here with nothing and you know all that kind of stuff. So she's like very much like, pick herself up by her bootstraps and she's, you know, uh, um, brown girl who didn't speak English and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and they were harsh with her because she started to make money. And cause that's how she thought she would get like a seat at the table. And, uh, and they were really harsh with her calling her trashy and stuff like that. Because this is something also that if you know, like people who are from like, like a better term, like the hood, when a lot of them get money, it's like, well, I'm going to, it's like great Gatsby. Like you're going to go out and you're going to show that you have money now. And you weren't really taught. Like we don't teach in inner city schools. We don't teach like finance, how to like be smart with your money. We don't teach that, which we should, but we don't. Uh, I think Kevin Hart's working on a, on a whole program for that, which is actually really cool. But um, uh, so what, what it's, it's like frowned upon that like, oh, these people are like new rich or whatever it is. And, uh, and they were really harsh with her because she, she would buy like whatever Valentino shoes or something. They basically called her like trashy and, and fake and vapid and stuff like that. So that was really hurtful that my family did. Um, and <laughs> and I, I don't talk to them anymore, which is unfortunate, the people that said that. Um, my thoughts on the Afghanistan issue, yeah, it's a mess. It's, it's a mess. Um, but I think it's good that we're not, we don't have a large presence there. Should we have kept a small presence there? Maybe, but I think leaving stuff there is a mess. I have a, one of my best friends flies Blackhawks in Colorado. I was like, hey, you want to go teach uh, some Taliban how to fly Blackhawks? He's like, no, nah, the Chinese got it. So he, he said the Chinese, the Russians are going to go teach them how to fly Blackhawks. And now they have Blackhawks, which sucks. <laughs> what am I going, Jerry? I would be so nervous to be on Joe Rogan's podcast. Um, but it would be cool. He's never had a teacher on. So I think in that way, it would be really cool to have him on or to, 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 to talk to him. But also, I think... Joe Rogan, as much as, you know, he's, he is what he is, you know, he's just kind of a wild dude and stuff. But I think he, um, I don't know, we have similar interests, you know, I mean, I've been doing jujitsu for a dozen years. I'm really into sports cars. You know, I like hunting, you know, um, all that kind of stuff. And I'd be cool to be able to talk to him about, um, the education system as well. But that's like, that's like the biggest gig to get on. If you're someone who's trying to like make a name for yourself, you get on Joe Rogan podcast, you're instantly, you know, at the top. So I, I don't see it happening anytime soon. Um, 
But yeah, it'd be, it'd be really rad though. Um, am I pro vaccine mandates? Uh, um, not widespread, but I think in certain environments, I think it should be, you know, maybe like healthcare or something like that, should be mandated and if you don't want it, a way to give you an out. So let's just say, I don't know, I don't know. Look, I don't know what I'm talking about. But let's just say that they say, all right, mandate it for school teachers. But if you don't wanna get it, you can go work here in this environment with these kids or something like that. So you're not, you're not like, am I gonna feed my family or am I gonna get this vaccine that I think I shouldn't get? Because even, um, there's a lot of people that even their doctors say you shouldn't get it and they lose their jobs. That's true, the drummer from, uh, from uh, um, Offspring said that. His doctor said, I don't recommend this based on your medical history. And he was banned from the studio and touring. Your doctor says, don't get it. And then the people in charge of these institutions who are not doctors say, okay, well then you can't work here anymore. F that. No, no, that's, that's where we're, we're losing ourselves, I think. Um, but yeah, give people an out. Who do I want for California governor? I don't know. I have it around here somewhere. I filled it out. I filled out the yes, I don't want Gavin Newsom there anymore. I think Gavin Newsom is bad. I think he's exactly the worst of politicians. But I don't know. I'm leaning toward Kevin Kiley. I just don't, Larry Elder, I, I heard his story. When he talked about his like life story, I, it warmed me up a little bit. Um, but I think, he's, I think he's more of a Republican ideologue. I think California, even though I've only voted Republican in California, I've never voted Republican in a, in a national election or anything like that. Um, I've only, I, first time I ever voted Republican in my life was in 2018. Um, I, st I think California needs a Republican. They need a conservative. Because the balance, look, the balance is off. So if I, look, if I was in Mississippi, I, I'm sure I would vote Democrat. I just, I'm a balance guy. And the balance is just way off in California. We need the balance back. So I I think I'm gonna go Kevin Kiley, but I don't know, um, seems smart. He's, he kind of speared the, spearheaded this thing too. So I was like, props to you. But anyway, you slice it, knew some out, is my opinion. But I saw some big celebrity, I forget who it was. Some like big celebrity was like, vote to keep Gavin Newsom is like, yeah, well, he's good for you. <laughs> You're a multi-millionaire living in Bel Air. Yeah, that's Gavin Newsom's people. Um, how much influence did my parents have on me becoming politically homeless? From my mom. No, I'm just kidding. Um, a lot, actually. So they're very left, you know, they're upper middle class, you know, East Coast white, liberal, um, everything like that. And that was like, that was like, that's just the way to be. Republicans were more, you know, um, immoral to some degree and stuff like that, or greedy and things like that. Uh, but uh, the the reason that I became more politically homeless is because to try and communicate with my, my parents on a lot of things, where this whole, a lot of this came from, is like trying to communicate with them while I also married into a family that was more conservative. And they were conservative while being immigrants you know, Pacific Islander, all these things, and being really kind, generous people. And I was like, wait a second, that's not, I thought Republicans were bad, you know, rich white dudes, old white dudes and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they had, they had, it was a big influence um, just because it was, I didn't know, I was only, you know, a square, let's say. So I just only knew squares. And then when I moved, I married into a family and that saw circles and I was like, oh man. So that's how I kind of became more politically homeless. And now I think I'm getting better at being able to communicate, find those common common areas and stuff like that. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, it was a great question. Favorite era to teach in history? 1920s and 1960s. Yeah. Um, 1920s, I think are just they're just rad. I think there's a lot of good lessons there about um, about uh, prohibition. I love the Harlem Renaissance a lot. I think that that idea of like getting your voice heard is so important. Uh, I love the idea of like art leading to um, massive social change, uh, Scopes trial, all that kind of stuff. But I also love the 1960s Vietnam War as horrible as, as it is. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned that we didn't learn. <laughs> um, 
I, uh, you know, I mean, the music from the 1960s is really good. Civil rights. It was just that that crazy time of so much change. And it was, the thing about the 1960s too is there was it was potential. It was potential to like, okay, now we're gonna call out these elites. We're gonna do something different. We're gonna do something different, and then we never we didn't learn from it. So it was a missed opportunity. I think tremendous missed opportunity. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, that's what I'd say. So 1920s, 1960s. I like that question. That's an easy one. <laughs> Uh, oh, it's the last last question. Um, do I follow Rebel Wisdom's work? A little bit. I think I've reached out to him. Seems like a good guy. He's talked a lot to the Weinsteins and stuff like that. Um, I think I reached out to him to talk, but like you know, I think it, part of what this is is like a bigger following. As gross as that is, um, will open up doors, and I want to have those doors open because not, not from it's really not for me. It's so I can represent y'all. Like I can represent y'all. You know, um, like these different viewpoints and stuff like that, if I can have those doors open and, and challenge ideas and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, um, okay, so it's 123. 130 is when I have to go pick up my, my kid. So um, thank you guys, this is really cool. Um, see some of you in here. Chevy, you know, as much as we disagree on things, I, I respect you and I appreciate you, man. Um, David, um, thank you. Yona, it's good to see you guys. Oh man, you guys are all just awesome. Have I ever thought about becoming a professor? Yes, I've thought about it a lot. I like teenagers. <laughs> Whoa, that sounds really bad. Don't take that out. <laughs> oh no. Um, they're, they're more malleable. They're more open-minded. Um, they're more insecure, which makes them, um, um, I think, more open to, to empathy and things like that. Yeah, so. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. I'll put this on my feed and you can do what you want with it. <laughs> really, thank you guys.